Well, thank you very much for uh, being here, for being here, and for for inviting us to and give us giving us this opportunity to talk about our work. Um, uh, um, this conference will will very much relate to the theme of the workshop, and and well, students have asked me the reason for the the theme, which is archaism. And I, I will try to give you an answer and, and tell you how it relates to the um, to the to the work we're doing in the office, even though it's not an, there's not an obvious relation. Uh, uh, and and I, I will try to make it more more clear. So the title is um, archaic Mo modernity, and um, what I should try first explain the, the, this title. Um, when we started uh, about 15 years ago, the, the office with my partner, Yves Moreau, uh, I think we, were, we didn't have a theoretical agenda at all, but I think we, we both wanted to be like modern architects, you know, in a very traditional sense, like it's sort of a, a naive ideal. And there were many discussions at the time, mostly in social sciences, about this idea of a new modernity, you know, after times of post-modernity. And uh, there were many uh, theories like, and many prefixes, you know, like uh, uh, hyper-modernity, super-modernity, trans-alter, retro-modernity. And everybody invented a, a new prefix to imagine what this new modernity would be, and um, uh, we, we we wanted which one we should choose um, for our for our own approach, and I think we weren't really happy with any of them uh, because they all seem to uh, continue the process of moder of modernization, but without the spirit of modernity and. It seemed like um, none of them was really uh, could really achieve th th this promise of a new start of modernity. So we thought we could uh, call back another modernity, uh, um, sort of a hidden, uh, hidden uh, side, hidden face of the first heroic modernity that had already existed existed in the uh, modern history. And this is not maybe the most obvious side uh, because uh, it, it happened in a few moments, we think. Uh, and, and we were thinking especially, for instance, of the, for instance, the Viennese uh, uh, secession where modernity was very, uh, a very anxious uh, moment and because uh, uh, the, the country was and the city was facing facing the the, the rise of the Nazi and uh, it was a very introspective and and dark modernity and there was another moment as well in the history uh, in in for instance in Italy after the war and it, it was a moment where for the the studios of of uh, the Cinecitta was occupied by the Allies and and the uh, filmmakers went to the street and started working with amateur uh, actors and they they imagined like a new a new cinema uh, that was dealing very much with uh, reality and and social uh, circumstances and there was something both joyful and dark uh, together at the same time and um, you know Hermann Broch um, called the, the, that moment in Vienna is the, the joyful uh, apocalypse. Um, th so this is a modernity that was quite different from Western modernity because it wasn't linked to uh, technological progress and it could accommodate and can even enjoy the restriction of means. You know, it, it, it did uh, could invent something new. Uh, by not necessarily looking for uh, um, uh, uh, 
but not really being utopian at all, but looking back at itself. So um, this, this is the kind of modernity we call the, the archaic modernity. And you know, of course, when you put together modern and archaic, it's, it's strange because these are two very contradictory terms. It's, it's a bit like a, an oxymoron. It's like obscure clarity. The, 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 the two words seems to say to mean something very different. Uh, usually, when you say something in that something is modern, it means that it uh, belongs to its time. Huh? It really fits. Uh, it's, it's an expression of uh, of the time. Uh, and when you say that something is archaic, usually you mean it's old, but it's not really exactly old. It's uh, offset from the time. It's uh, it's uh, like a, it's like an old an old fashioned expression, or it's like uh, I don't I don't know any uh, in English. My English not good enough, um, but it's like um, uh, a character. Uh, an actor in a peplum, you know, and he w he would have a digital watch, There's something strange, you know, uh, w with the time. Um, so archaic is, has this meaning in in, in our in our sense. Um, so archaic means uh, it comes from the Greek. It, it means origin or or beginning. Uh, so if you think of an archaic modernity, it means that. It's a modernity that is looking for its own origins, that is uh, trying to, uh, to look back at, uh, at where it comes from. And of course, this is not clear. This is not the truth of modernity. It's, it can be totally fictional. Huh? You can totally imagine your own origin. It's like, um, I think, uh, uh, I don't know how, if it's probably the same word in English and in French, like the uh, prequels you know the in superheroes movies now you see that there's uh, there are new scripts no new scenarios and they actually uh, tell you about the, the the past what was before the the, the 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 original movie and usually you you discover the the childhood of the superheroes and there's a big drama and then you sort of discover how the uh, superheroes uh, gain their their superpowers because of the drama. So this, this is the kind of archaic um, scenario. So this is that kind of modernity, which is a bit uh, retroactively. We thought maybe that was our agenda. We didn't know so, uh, at the moment when we started. This is very an anachronic, uh, anachronistic uh, kind of uh, modernity where you may not have to oppose what's new and what's old and you may not oppose progress and 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 regress uh, it's a kind of modernity where uh, that would have exchanged its a wish to uh, of, a wish of desire for conquest uh, and um, with uh, or against um, uh, more um, interior quest, you know. So it's a. I, 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 I do admit that it's a, maybe it's a very abstract idea. So I wanted to start by um, uh, with an illustration of, of what this could mean. So this is a series of photographs uh, by a, a Japanese uh, photographer whose name is Toshio Shibata. And he um, he takes pictures of these uh, uh, supporting structures along Japanese steep uh, Japanese roads in the mountains, and um, I, I found this this structures quite um, interesting and f um, f for different reasons. I think I think one reason is that. Uh, they're both very brutal and and refined, you know, because they, you know, they are infrastructures, so they're very brutal, you know, they're not designed really by anybody. And at the same time, if you look at the details, they're, they're wonderful architectural uh, details. 
And there's a, another thing that is really, I find very fascinating about these structures is that um, you don't know exactly if uh, they are in a state of progress or in a state of regress. Because you may imagine that they're a bit like uh, the grid of, uh, of colonial cities, you know, that, that this, this actually concrete grids are covering the mountains and the, the, uh, the more they go, the more they will cover the mountains and tame the, the very uh, wild landscape. But you may imagine just the opposite. You know, for instance, you may it could be that the, the water here is, ri is, is rising, the level, and that the, the wild grass, the flowers will, are growing, and that these grids are actually disappearing. You know, you, both, both uh, processes could be, could be true. Um, so we don't really know if you we, if we have to interpret them as modern grids, or if we should look at them as uh, romantic ruins. You know, they can be really both. Um, I thought so. So I think this doubt, this tension between these two possible potential processes, um, is what this this archaic modernity is about. It's very much uh, we could compare that to um, um, an age of like um, teenagehood, for instance, you know, uh, or adolescence. You know, it's you, it's a moment where you could uh, either project yourself into adulthood. You you may want you know you're in in an intermediate state. Or you may also wish to remain into childhood, you know, and then you don't know whether you have to become an adult or you want to, you know, kill yourself because you know, teenagers have they nourish very dark feelings sometimes. You know, it's a moment of crisis. Um, So I think in our work, we may find two figures that somehow talk about this ambivalent moment, this, this strange transi transi transitional uh, edge. And these two figures are the rune and the grid. You know, these two figures that we found in Toshio Shibata's photographs, pretty much as in this uh, picture here. Um, so. I will start with with the project uh, of the office by starting from one figure, which is the rune, actually. So this is a this is a very small project for it's a, a gas it's a technical uh, gas uh, equipment that we, you 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 get thousands and thousands around. Uh, around Paris, and usually you don't even notice them because they're small concrete blocks and they're covered with graffitis. And so we were asked to do a, a, a small series of them. Um, and this is uh, this one. Here, they're all different. This one is very much like a, a rune, and maybe more exactly like you know. Um, I don't know if you know the uh, Robert Smithson. Um, um, Rune in reverse, you know. Smith and he 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 says he's building runes, but these runes do not fall into a state of rune. They they rise into runes. They go towards the 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 rune. Um, so th this is a small building that we imagine very much like a, a like a military uh, tent, but, uh, and but that would stay on the site and 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 vegetation would grow and in the end it, it would only remain like a big would be like a big bush you know it would be covered with vegetation with only the the outer the white outer frame uh, remaining and, and 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 reminding about the the original uh, building so it's it's a little an anthropic uh, building and uh, one day, the, um, a company of uh, data centers, they called us, and because they noticed that we were interested in small technical objects. 
and they asked us to design a, to design a, a generic a generic model, something that they could uh, use for any kind of site. They were working mostly in the south of France. So we started from the very opposite uh, uh, figure, which is the, the grid. And we, it was the time where the uh, Tron uh, Legacy II uh, ca came out at the movie theater. So we all went to watch the movie. And, and we thought we would use that, that figure because it, it related to the digital world. And uh, we imagined for them sort of a, an idea that could, that, that could apply to any kind of sites uh, working with this uh, grid uh, um, of two meters and a half by two meters and a half, which could both uh, apply to the uh, to the car park and and to the structure of the building uh, itself, and um, and we realized that you know in the movie um, uh, Jeff Bridges uh, actually talks about the grid and he explains that this grid is the digital frontier and we thought it was a nice metaphor because it really uh, says that this grid is really uh, an image of the uh, Jefferson uh, the, the Jefferson's grid you know, the movie really delivers a message uh, more or less that, that and the message more or less is that uh, this uh, very graphical Grid means it is a symbol of the new uh, digital world, uh, and as the the, the west, the, you know, the Western world of, of America was, you know, it's really the limit between uh, the new territory that that is still wild because we haven't uh, explored it yet. And so we thought that the, the metaphor w was pretty pretty nice and was not that clear but if you if you listen to the dialogues it, it becomes more more clear so of course the the client didn't like the idea and um, so we we used it for a, uh, another project that was somehow not so different because it was in a very um, generic place uh, uh, around in the suburb uh, of Paris uh, we used it for a small project uh, which is a, a business incubator. It's a small, but it's a public project, um, and it's situated in a business park. Like like you got, you know, you have plenty of them uh, wow. in the suburb of Paris. And this is pretty much a shed. It's actually a decorated shed, but we thought we would uh, decorate it with a mission, a mis facade. We thought it would be funny to use a totally um, postmodern concept and apply a, a totally uh, modern icon on it. So uh, of course Miss he would have never uh, cut the, the, his, his glass like you know with little stairs at the, at, the, at the bottom so we're just working with this reference. So it's a black sort of a black box. Uh, that reflects the, the different co commercial and industrial sheds and the landscape that's uh, all around. And we use the same idea of the same grid, same dimension that integrates both the, the structure of the building itself and and the car parks. And sometimes, you know, it, it's so even you know even the fence is is really follows the the, the grid sometimes. So sometimes even the trees, the, the trees, they look like they, they fit into the grid, even though they, they were there before. And that was at the same moment we were, we, we had our first uh, um, big commission. It was a, um, a public competition for social housing in Paris, in a very beautiful place, um, very sort of lost within Paris because the metros are pretty far. And um, we used it with much the same vocabulary, uh, you know, with the, the uh, dark uh, um, painted uh, glass. And, but we added an extra element, which is the, the sun, the sunshade, 
the white sunshades, which is a very domestic uh, uh, device. Um, so the building is, is situated on a hill. It's next to, for those who know Paris, next to Père Lachaise, uh, the, the cemetery, and has a, the, the, you have really have a beautiful view if you just uh, up in the in the in the upper levels, and also faces uh, a water tank, which is flat, totally flat. So you, you know you, there won't be any construction uh, in front of the building, and we try to design something very abstract in order to relate to this blank uh, green uh, green space. So in fact, the, the, the building uh, accommod integrates three different activities, uh, which are first the social housing on the left, and there's also a kindergarten on, on the ground floor, and there's uh, also on, on, on the right side, there's uh, uh, an emergency housing, something for young people who live in the street, and they, they, they provide them like a tiny room for just a, a few months to give them a sort of a temporary home. So this, of course, the three programs do not really fit with each other. Really. They, so we decided that we would separate them really uh, fun uh, functionally, but we tried to treat the entire building as a, as a more homogeneous uh, entity so as to relate to the large scale uh, of the, the landscape, this is the, the back and the front. So the, the, if, you, if you see the, the flats, they're very, uh, this was our first housing building, so uh, we really looked at how, um, you know, this, is a, this is a very typical typology of, of uh, flats in, in Paris at the moment. Uh, they, they, these are flats that uh, face east and west, so we only introduce small uh, gaps in size, so large flats would have three orientations. And the rest of the, the work really uh, is, you can only read it in, in, the, in the section and on the, the structure of the, the sun blinds that we use, not only for the sun, because they're also on the northeast side, but also as a way to darken the rooms and also as a way to protect yourself from the view from the, the neighbors. Uh, so. Uh, that's that's a picture of the since the, the building was pretty narrow you could really give a nice view to the to the to the bathroom we thought it would be nice to just you know you could be naked in your, ba in your bathroom and looking at the landscape I think there would be a nice could have a nice feeling uh, being in such a, a narrow building and that that sun shades you know of course since it's um, situated outside the, the balconies, they, they, they create sort of a exterior room and, and people appropriate it because when they, when they are down, you really feel like it's an extra room. And so since everybody can activate, can manipulate the sun shades, uh, it produces that kind of pattern, you know, the, the chessboard pattern, because the the the, the, the shades are, uh, are white and the building is naturally uh, black with the with the with the glass at, uh, on the at the back of of the balconies. So I'm now shifting from uh, or the the focus because this is a um, we the. The office uh, started working on on public facilities, and um, uh, and so far we were pretty much focused on on the skin on on object that would almost exist more by their absence than uh, than by their uh, presence, and we started working a lot more, being much more interested. Uh, by um, uh, infrastructures and, and, and technological uh, landscapes. Um, 
this happens mainly um, when we started working on a project called the City of Virtual Reality in, in Laval, France. It's a medium-sized uh, city, it's a uh, regional capital, let's say. And, and the idea here was really to imagine a, a technological city. Um, uh, the, the building uh, was meant to be built between in a, a former military wasteland, between you know a, a big mall and, and a suburban housing. Uh, and the project was named the City of Virtual Reality. So we thought let's make a city, but then we didn't. The building was not big enough to to create. I mean, we didn't have building mass to create um, really like a, something like a city. So we thought we could integrate another um, building that was meant to be built next to ours, which was um, a stadium, a 3,000 seat stadium. And we proposed to bring the two projects together. So of course, well, we thought we would lose the project anyway. So we had no problem saying, ah, let's put everything together. It was, it was a international competition. So we we didn't think we had the chance, but uh, but the, I think the mayor really liked the idea for di for reasons that um, for different reasons actually. Uh, this he took, so you here on this picture from the, uh, the top you you really have the initial program on the left and and uh, the the arena stadium on 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 the right. And the so the pro project looked really much like a a pizza, you know. Where you put everything, you know, you have a round a circle and you put everything uh, on top of it and all the different components sort of create like a, a possible mix. You know, you can have a pizza, any taste. Um, so the, the, this is a gesture of drawing the city by defining first the limits of the city. So you define what it's the intra murals from the extra murals so that gives you that gives a value to what's in, inside compared to what is outside and I think the the mayor understood that and he didn't want actually he said we won't we probably won't do the stadium but that's that extra half part will be interesting for us to attract companies in the in the field of virtual uh, virtual uh, virtual uh, of simulation, 3D simulation. So you you will do the first part, and we will do the second. You know, it's it, it's a good, it's a fair. Uh, it was the agreement. We say, okay, we'll do the first one, and you manage. If you want us to do the second part, we'll be <laughs> we'll be here. Um, so this is this is how we compare the site. It's uh, about 100. Uh, meters that, uh, of diameter. So we compare the center of the city of Laval to the, to the, to the new project, show them it almost had the size of a small, of a small district. So this, 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 there was a, we, what we proposed is a, um, something of a, an imaginary, uh, um, a corpus of images that related both to the city and also to the science fiction. And, uh, this is like a, more or less an image of the Death Star, or you have, we had in mind this installation by Until You, you know, who works with um, uh, air, condition, uh, air conditioning uh, boxes that do not work anymore. And uh, you, you, have, you have these strange spaceships as well by, um, Hamada, who worked with, with uh, uh, recycled materials to create spaceships. So this is really like a, a, a future that belongs to, to the past, because you know, uh, Star Wars was in the past. This is a previous uh, civilization. And uh, these all, of course, you can see the spaceship doesn't really, doesn't really fly. Um, but, but that relates that relates to a certain world. But that's the building that seen from, from the top. Uh, the competition was, was won, but we never built it because the, the mayor changed and uh, the new mayor didn't like the project. 
uh, at all. So these are the two. The, the it's almost like a project from this from the 60s, pretty much. And uh, there, there's a in the middle. There's a there's a road that separates and and connects the two uh, the two programs. The, the stadium and this, the city of virtual reality that is uh, composed of uh, there, there were three schools. Um, there was one one company. Um, and shared facilities and an auditorium and uh, a small a small restaurant. It looks pretty much like an electronic uh, chip. And um, we imagine that this mass, this virtual city, would be crisscrossed by um, large um, streets or like networks. We didn't say streets. We did. We said networks. Of, of very large uh, circulations, they, they are um, four meters wide, so that any circulation space can become a potentially inhabited uh, space. You, you know, you, you couldn't distinguish where um, circulate um, places for circulation from places for for activity. Uh, this was a way. To give an address, actually, to the different activities within the within the circle. Um, this is another project uh, that is more or less related. It's, act it's actually uh, older, and we were not uh, totally mastering the project. We were uh, only associates. Uh, we are associated to an architect from Bordeaux, whose name is Jean de Jacinto, and this is a school. Um, uh, in Clichy, in a uh, really close uh, Parisian suburb. And uh, here we became pretty much interested to the theme of the, the building site, the building process, uh, uh, because the, 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 the building is actually um, made with this, um, uh, I don't know, portals or porticos, like the, the, the structure that are Cast, uh, cast on the site as each one is one piece. It, it really, the, the company really did a great job being able to cast everything one for all, all at once. And they, they really made a special effort. And um, I think we didn't control the whole design, actually. And But we thought the structure would be a nice, a really nice feature of the building. And we thought that even though um, the project, even when when the project would be finished, this, this structure would remain visible and somehow testify of the or remind of the the building moment. And the 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 the, the building moment was really really nice, really interesting. You really had beautiful moments uh, within this. Structure, of course. Sometimes you hope that the building would just remain as it is, you know, just grow because you know what's going to come after won't be as good, of course. And oh, we thought maybe we could try to keep that that um, raw rawness of construction um, as part of. We could integrate that that, that moment. Uh, as part of the building, really. I mean, we thought even though it was a previous life, then there'll be signs uh, in, in of, of its existence. Um, that's the plan, and that we. What happened is that the the the, the main idea it was in a former industrial land, and the soil was so polluted. I mean, I never seen that. It was like black, totally black soil. So we had to take away a whole part of this, the, the, the earth of the land. And um, we were sad about it because the, this, this, the site is very interesting. This is a plateau, uh, a former plateau. And it's all raised from the rest of the city. And of course, the, the, the plan was to take away every everything even because it was polluted so we took away the the saw and but the idea was to reconstitute this piece of geography and to replace exactly 
uh, the, the polluted soil by the, by the new building. So the building follows exactly the shape of the, of the lot. And, to, and that's, that's the reason why it's very low. It's actually, we had to compact it a lot. The, uh, so it's a bit smaller than, than expected. But the roof is really aligned uh, with the existing uh, site, uh, which has been converted and in, turned into a, a, green, a green park. Um, so the, the particularities that of the building is that there's a slope and you have actually two schools, you know, uh, kids from uh, three to six and six to ten. And, and the two schools, they, they overlap in the middle. Uh, so each one is on the ground floor, which is pretty a way to deal with the, this kind of program. You don't, you don't want stairs in, in schools for, for the kids. And in the middle, you have this rich structure where all the, the, the activities that are shared by the two schools are assembled, uh, concentrated. You, you have a space uh, on the ground, which is the, we, we call the cave. Uh, it wasn't planned, but you know, it just came out of the section. And we, we convinced the, our client that uh, kids love, love caves. Because if you tell your clients we're going to create a cave, they were like, no, you won't. They say, no, kids, they love the caves, you know, they really do. And they say, uh-huh, all right. And then you have the big rooms, you know, that for the mayor, when he, for the election, he will, he, he will organize it here for, for sure. And on the roof, you have the, uh, the garden, you know, for the, for the kids. Uh, this is the, the interior, the, skin, the outer skin is really, for us, was just meaningless. We used that, that, um, that um, material, that glass with fo integrated foam, and that gives this very soft, very, very soft light inside. And the court, on the, within the court, we designed a, a, la a labyrinth, a maze. And that is a, a really a real one. You know, we, you, there's really a, an entrance and an exit. So the, if the kids really want to, they can really uh, walk through. So this is a building we sort of try to play with uh, myth mythological figures, pretty much. I think we try to make something like, you know, there are pyramids on the roof, and you have the cave, and the the, the, the heavy structure and the labyrinth. So it was pretty quotations, you know, of, of mythical, mythical uh, figures. Um, so this is, this is a moment we, we started looking more into the realm of the infrastructure than within the realm of the, of architecture as such. And, um, and we started enjoying a lot more the, this, this, kind of structures that uh, show a certain weight, you know, and also a state of uh, unfinishedness. I'm not sure you can say there's such a word in English. It's the, the fact that they, their beauty remain, um, comes from the fact they, they, they have a potential to, to grow, you know, to become something else. That's, so that's what we, we try to use for the Sacre uh, building on the Paris Saclay campus, we try to push the idea a little bit further. The, the idea that we would make a, a building that would not be finished ever. Huh? That would be in a, you know, like I was saying, like a, in a sort of teenage uh, state of of mind. And and this in this so in this building, actually actually we had no money. We couldn't actually the budget was too low, we couldn't build it anyway. So we reduced the amount of uh, activities. We, we proposed to associate different activities in the same spaces. And we also tried to reduce all the things we could. We thought, we thought if we can build the structure first, we should the structure remains, then it's a good thing. And then we'll use the less possible, potentially as little material as possible for all the finishes. So it was really, at the beginning, it was really a, 
an economical decision and of course it became an aesthetic decision of course you have to be clear with your with yourself um, and somehow this is a this is a decision that related to the condition to the context in reality because this is um, Paris Saclay is, is a new campus uh, for Paris, uh, southwest of Paris, and uh, this is um, a national project. It's a huge project, and it is um, it's the, the idea is to create a new campus in a place that's almost empty. So it's like almost a new city, even though you have really on a large scale a lot of existing institutions. You have. For instance, uh, uh, Renault, the Cars, Renault uh, the Research uh, Center. You have the French Institute for uh, Nuclear Research. You have the uh, um, University of Mathematics. Uh, uh, um, you have Polytechnics, huge, famous university. You have the main um, uh, business schools. And none of these institutions communicate with each other because the, the only reason they all went to that place is to be on their own, to, be, to, feel, to do whatever they wanted. They didn't they want to be in the center of Paris, so they all moved there one day. And uh, the place had been um, already uh, uh, analyzed, I, I remember, in the 90s by Manuel Castells uh, as one of the new technological uh, spots in the world, like they, this huge concentration of famous uh, institution on, on, on new technologies. But if you get to the place so vast, it's so big that it's not really a place uh, of, uh, as itself. So the idea of the, the French government is to make it a campus with like a new plan by um, uh, architect, by the, uh, made by planner, uh, Xavier de, de, de Reiter, de Geter. and you have you see the, the building by OMA on the on the right here, and today it's a strange place because there's no public space. So the idea of the, this new building was to create a new public space where uh, these inst the students and researchers uh, and the employees as well of uh, working on the campus could meet each other. There would be any. Now, the roads are roads, they're not even streets, they have no sidewalk. Um, so we, what we propose is to make a vertical public space. We said, we, this, the first building, I guess, of a series that we did afterwards, uh, that's about starting a city without any um, built matter. You know, it, we, we thought we had to make the, almost the first building of the city, and um, the question was, how do you start? You know, how does the new, the first building should uh, integrate the idea of the city to come, even though the city is not there yet. Uh, so we imagine pretty much that building as being a, a sort of a big shelf, you know, uh, large floors, large open floors, uh, but with a, a stair, a staircase that would that would cross uh, the building from the bottom from the bottom to the top. And this stair is particular because it's it's both inside the building, but it's open to the air. So inside, it's uh, both inside and outside. It's a bit like in a Klein bottle, you know. It's hard to know whether you are inside or outside. Um, so the building, if you want, if you want to understand it, this is your, you can only understand it from the, from the, the sections. Uh, the, the series are of cross sections. Um, so the idea, the, the, also another important idea is that we defined um, spaces inside they, that were not used for anything. They were they were unspecified spaces. This was a big discussion with our client to say, um, you don't have the money, so. You make the structure, but you don't make a room. So we have we've had such spaces, such as uh, um, you know this, this huge the stair that is way too big for what it meant 
for uh, you, the the roof is is uh, is is a, uh, it uh, hosts uh, two basketball uh, courts. You have a, a path underneath the building for to to park the bikes. You have these kinds of um, terrace mezzanine space on the first floor um, that do not respond to anything in in the brief. Uh, it initially it was meant for for um, meeting meeting rooms where, where people can meet in the cafeteria. It's, you know, you don't need like a formal meeting room. And that's where we that we we grew the idea that we could imagine buildings that would be rooms, sort of a sort of a room, but not like a, a romantic room that is sort of you know that is destroying itself, but a, a, a rune in a state of becoming, you know, something that is not only really, uh, finished, we call it a joyful rune, uh, as a reference to the joyful um, apocalypse. So this is, I think this is a kind of rune that you, you may find, for instance, in, in that series of photographs by Amélie Labourdette. She took photographs mainly in Sicily, and also in the south of Italy, of infrastructures and buildings uh, whose construction have been interrupted. They, they, they are stopped. So these are not really ruins. And I think you can feel that. You can feel that they're in a special state of, they're, aw uh, they're awaiting. You know, they, 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 they're not really sad buildings. They, they haven't been destroyed. It's simply that construction has been stopped. And I think this, this really makes a difference uh, because that does, it's not about entropy, really. It's about, you know, stopping for a while, even though we know uh, it's quite unlikely they that they will continue the, the construction later. But still, the rune is, uh, is a little bit, it has a different feeling, I think. And I think the there are buildings that possess this 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 uh, uh, rune in a state of becoming, such as this this Tower of Shadows by Le Corbusier in Chandigarh. I think this 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 building doesn't really have an edge. You know, it's it's from 1950. I think it's a beautiful building, but it, it's hard to give it and an, it's hard to say when it dates from. And there's also, for instance, that that. Uh, New Sky Building by uh, uh, Watanabe in Tokyo. Um, it's a metabolist building, and no, like any old metabolist building was supposed to grow. And of course, it didn't, like none of the buildings from the metabolist really grew, and that's maybe better that they didn't, uh, because they remain in a state like, you know, they, they of being also unfinished. And this building in particular was meant to be destroyed. It was really abandoned. And it was saved from destruction a few years ago. And it, it was uh, reborn, you know, like the, like the phoenix. And, and we painted in this really light uh, colors. It was really raw at the beginning. But, but maybe it's better now than it was before. And uh, also, there's you know this very famous example of this the, the Caracas Tower, but the Torre David, uh, and it's photographed by Iwan Ban. You know this, I, I'm, that's for the students. You know the maybe the story. The that, uh, David is actually the, the investor, and he died during the construction. And since he died, the, uh, the, the building was abandoned, and it became a vertical squat. You know, and and. And probably that that other life w is much more interesting than the initial planned life. You know, it, probably what happens inside today is more interesting than you know just an, an office building. And I I think there's a, probably a lesson to 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 learn from that building is that um, first buildings may have different lives. You may integrate this idea that. The, the initial activity is just the initial one. The, something else can may happen. So, um, and also that the constraint, the constraint to, of verticality, for instance, gives you more freedom. 
you know, the, idea, the, the quality of this building is not free space. It's not like flat, neutral space, but it's verticality. And even though it's high, so, so it's a tower there, there's 1,000 families living in the tower. That, and they sort of climb the tower every day. That's quite crazy, but maybe this was a good thing, uh, the, 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 initial con the initial constraint. Um, so this, uh, the, the idea of the vertical squat, is, um, it's an idea that we took, we borrowed for a, a building in, a housing building in Paris. It's a competition we lost, actually. Um, and that, that was, we were asked by um, uh, a private developer who uh, usually makes um, single family houses to imagine a co uh, collective, collective housing. Uh, they they called the Kaufmann and Hood, and they're very known in France to do uh, uh, catalog houses. They are pretty much all the same, but they, you can change the facades. They're very very known. They're very big. They also do collective housing, but they had the feeling at least one guy in, the, in this huge company had the feeling that they weren't so good for collective housing. You know, they were you could not recognize a, a Kaufmann and Hood building. They say so. They say, could you help us imagine collective housing? But based on the, our knowledge of, of uh, single family uh, villas. So we thought, yeah, well, of course, because you know, there's a tradition in architecture, the immobile villa, you know, we, there's been many attempts to combine individuality and collective, you know, that there's something to be done. And uh, so we, we, what we propose, in, this is a very small, narrow site, we propose to build three towers really connected to each other uh, with all um, collective spaces uh, made coll made uh, collective. You know, they, they, they actually the the balconies and the loggia are are shared. Oh, sorry, are shared by the uh, the different flats or workshops. So the idea was that each floor uh, would be either a flat or an atelier, a workshop could be anything uh, the, the owners would want. You know, it was meant to be sold, really. It, so it's it, it's meant to fo to be uh, the ho home of a of a probably small community uh, that would that would that would be both very autonomous because they can do whatever they want into their in inside their their home. Uh, but that would be that would be very much linked by the fact that they they would they would have to share all the exterior spaces. So it's a bit like the Sackler building where you have a lot of exterior space. You know, in the Sackler building, you really have fifty percent outside, fifty percent inside. It's approximately the um, uh, the organization, and. Here we're not far from that organization, and you really have you have a, the, the the stairs are all, all outside. So it, it it's quite an interpretation of that you know maybe, probably you know that project from James Wines, uh, which is called a high rise of homes. The idea that you to try rethink the co co propriety and and the possibility of living. Uh, together and at the same time as uh, separately. Oh yeah, and of, of course what we propose to the client is that uh, um, the owners could choose their, their facade from a catalog of, 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 we did a small catalog of eight facades. Um, no, that, that was part of the, the concept. Uh, which is a good thing because it's always difficult to design facade. We, you know, pretty easy. With it's always like a, a two big question. So we're pretty, we thought the idea was would be easy, uh, would make it easy for us. Last, uh, this is the last project. Uh, it's a comp public competition, or a public-private competition. We won last year in in July uh, in Montpellier. Uh, it's a typical program for us, you know. It, it's an incubator for young high-tech companies in Montpellier, south of France as well. Um, this is also the first building of the district, and this is also the same uh, urban planner as in uh, Saclay. So we, it's a typical 
absolutely typical without uh, briefs. This is for us. Uh, so this is something between the uh, situation of Saclay with the plan uh, of Laval. So this, but this is still a new a new idea. We 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 thought that we would um, but very much in Archism imagine the perfect grid, the perfect uh, configuration for offices for an office building. You know, starting with this the the, the non-stop the no-stop city. You know, with it's. It's a plan that's based very much on, on, on the repetition of bathroom, toilets, and, and kitchens of you know, static elements uh, repeating themselves. Uh, and that's more or less what we did starting from um, the core, uh, uh, the, the, the functional cores, you know, where you have uh, this vertical circula circulation and toilets uh, as well, and we thought we would use this course and and organize everything, all the all the workspaces uh, around and around patios because this is a southern city. There's a lot of sun, so it's a very introverted uh, building. And this is this is the the initial module. You know, uh, it, it's twelve by twelve. Uh, this is a dimension we use uh, a lot because it's a very efficient. It's very efficient. It's very economical for in terms of of uh, a structure of concrete structure. It's it's also pretty interesting for uh, office building because it means you have um, uh, naturally lit spaces everywhere uh, except in, within the the, the cores. And the idea is to use that that module and then you can expand it. In, uh, as much as you like, it's like the start of a city, and that was a bit the discourse since it's the first building, and the the outer limit of the building is also the the site itself. Um, it, it, we didn't. There's no. It's not a, it's a specific shape. Everything comes from the. It's a centrifugal uh, building, and this is we work with young designers to uh, imagine the furniture that would. Uh, that we could uh, bring in order to start the building before the, the, the companies would come and 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 appropriate the the building from uh, for themselves. So this is the end of this uh, conference. I I will make a small. I think this is the last slide. Yep. Uh, I will make a small conclusion. Um, I don't know if I've been very. Clear, but what I this is a selection of projects. What I tried to show is that there were two figures, which is the grid and the rune, that could mix with each other. These are, um, I would say, these are opposite figures because one is uh, very much the, uh, a modern figure of, of conquest, expansion, development, and progress, and. The other, the rune, is very much the opposite. You know, it's really something that relates to the to contemplate. You know, the rune, the romantic rune, is about contemplation, about loneliness and regrets and time uh, flowing. And it, and we thought the two could connect each other because, of course, modernity belongs to our past today. So it. Can be a, they, they can be connected. They can be related in this idea of a of an archaic modernity that I think disrupts a little bit the the idea of the linear time of, of modern history and, and this this um, this process of one epoch following each other and erasing the the previous one every time. You know this need for the new and this opposition from the old and the new. So why raise such a narrative? Of course, this is a narrative that I have, okay, I have sort of created it for the purpose of the conference. Huh? You know, I mean, it's not like a real absolute uh, theory. But why, why raise this narrative today? It's because I think it responds to a situation that we know, um, we know in France and maybe, maybe in Europe as well, uh, maybe not in the whole Western world, but uh, I guess previously uh, colonial countries, I think, have this 
problem today that uh, they're, they're trapped between two narratives, two existing strong narratives today. You know, there's first the, the, the old narrative, modern narrative of modernity that remains in our blood. This is our DNA, you know, we've always conquered the world and, and we still have modern infrastructures and not so many factories, but a few, you know, and, and with, there's still something in our landscape that talk, that tells about our uh, prestigious and heroic past. Uh, and there's another narrative that is very much uh, linked to the to the crisis, you know, the crisis of ecolo the ecological crisis, economical crisis, but of course this is uh, a crisis of uh, this is an identity crisis, you know, of Europe because we we are only realizing that we do, we're not the masters of the world anymore, and this is you know it's hard to to believe, but that's the truth. So it's it's this is an, another narrative that calls for austerity, you know, we have we've had strong debates about it and degrowth and that gives you very different perspectives. The two I think the two narratives are hard to to relate. So the idea of this uh, archaic modernity is to make a distinction uh, something more um, exciting or something potential, something uh, uh, quite natural. And it's, I think, a way to remind, to, uh, to remind us to re that you know, we've, we've known moments of crisis in our Western you know, civilization, um, such as you know, um, the Italian uh, uh, it, post-war Italy or, or Vienna uh, between the two wars. We we have known these moments of crisis, of transitions, and this crisis, they have been very interesting moments. Uh, they have been moments of self-questioning, and they have been also moments of intense emulation, of artistic and intellectual emulation, I should, should take today's moment as maybe one of those moments of uh, crisis. Uh, thank you for your attention.